One of Us is Lying, Part 2, Hide and Seek. Chapter 10, Bronwyn, Monday, October 1st, 7.30 a.m. I get ready for school on Monday, the way I always do. Up at 6 so I can run for half an hour, oatmeal with berries and orange juice at 6.30, a shower 10 minutes later, dry my hair, pick out clothes, put on sunscreen, scan the New York Times for 10 minutes, check my email, pack my books, make sure my phone's fully charged. The only thing that's different is 7.30 meeting with my lawyer. Her name is Robin, Robin Safford. Stafford. And according to my father, she's brilliant, highly su successful criminal defense attorney, but not overly high profile, not the kind of lawyer automatically associated with guilty rich people trying to buy their way out of trouble. She's right on time and gives me wide, warm smile when Maeve lead leads her into the kitchen. I wouldn't be able to guess her age by looking at her, but she's but the bio my father showed me last night says she's 41. She's wearing a cream-colored suit that's striking against her dark skin, subtle gold jewelry, and shoes that look expensive but not Jimmy Choo level. She takes a seat at our kitchen island across from my parents and me. Bronwyn's a pleasure. Let's talk about Bronwyn. It's a pleasure. Let's talk about what might expect today and how you should handle school. Sure, because my li that's my life now. School is something to be handled. She folds her hands in front of her. I'm not sure the police truly believe the four of you planned this together, but I do think that they hoped to shock and pressure one of you into giving up useful information. That indicates their evidence is flimsy at best. If none of you point fingers and your stories line up, they don't have anywhere to take this investigation. And it's my belief that that it it's my belief it will ultimately be closed out as an incidental death. The vice that has been gripping my chest all morning loosens a little. Even though Simon was about to post those awful things about us, and there's a whole Tumblr thing going on, Robin gives an elegant little shrug. At the end of the day, that's nothing about gossip and trolling. I know that I know you kids take it seriously, but it's le it's legal world. It's meaningless unless hard proof and more juice to back it up. The best thing you can do. Not talk about the case, certainly not with the police, but not with school administration either. What if they ask? Tell them you remain retained counsel and can't answer questions without your lawyer present. I try to imagine having a conversation with Principal Gupta. I don't know what the school's heard about this, but me pleading the fifth would be a major red flag. Are you friendly with other kids who were in, de in detention that day? Robin asked. Not exactly. Cooper and I have had some classes together, but... Bronwyn, my, my mother interrupts with a chill in her voice. You're friendly enough with Nate McCauley that showed up here last night for the third time. Robin sits straighter in her, in her chair. I flush. That was a big topic of discussion last night after my dad made Nate, made Nate leave. Dad thought he'd stalked our address in a creepy way, so I had some explaining to do. Why was Nate been here three times, Bronwyn? Robin asked with a polite interest, polite interest, interested air. It's no big deal. He gave me a ride home after Simon died, then stopped by last Friday to hang out for a while, and I don't know what he was doing here last night, since nobody would let me talk to him. It's the hanging out while your parents aren't home that disturbs me. Mother starts, but Robin interrupts her. Bronwyn, that's the nature of your relationship with Nate? I have no idea. Maybe you could help me analyze it. Is that part of your retainer? I hardly know him. I haven't talked to him in years before last week. We're both in this weird situation, and it, it helps to be around other people going through the same thing. I recommend maintaining distance from others, Robin says, ignoring my mother's evil eye in my direction. No need to give the police further ammunition for their theories. If, you're, if your cell phone and email are examined, they will show recent communications with those three students. No, I say truthfully. That's good news. She glances at her watch, a slim gold Rolex. That's all that we can address now and if you're going to get to school on time, which you should, business as usual. She flashes me that warm smile again. We'll talk more in depth later. I say goodbye to my parents, not quite able to look at them in the eye. I call for Maeve to gra as I grab my keys to the Volvo. I spend the whole time drive the whole drive stealing at myself for something awful to happen once we get to school but weirdly but it's weirdly normal. No police lying in wait for
for me. Nobody's looking at me any differently than they have since the first Tumblr post came out. Still, I'm only half paying attention to Kate and Yumiko's chatter after homeroom. My eyes roam in the hallway. There's only one person I want to talk to, even though it's exactly who I'm supposed to stay away from. Catch you guys later, okay? I murmur and intercept Nate as he ducks to the back of the stairwell. So if he's surprised to see me, he doesn't show it. Bronwyn, how's the family? I lean against the wall next to him and lower my voice. I wanted to apologize for my dad making me leave last night. He's kind of freaked out by all of us. Wonder why. Nate drops his voice as well. You've been searched yet? My eyes widen. He laughs darkly. Didn't think so. I was. You're probably not supposed to be talking to me, right? I can't help but glance around the empty stairwell. I'm already paranoid that Nate's and Nate's not helping. I have been kept I have to keep reminding myself that we did not, in fact, conspire to commit a murder. So why did you stop by? His eyes search mine as though he's about to say something profound about life and death and the presumption of innocence. I was going to apologize for stealing Jesus from you. I recoil a little. I have no idea what he's talking about. He's making some kind of religious allegory. What? In the fourth grade, nativity play at... St. Pius, I stole Jesus, and you had to carry a bag wrapped in a blanket. I'm sorry about that. I stare at him for a second, and the tension flows out of me, leaving me limp and slightly giddy. I punch him in the shoulder, startling him so much he actually laughs. I knew it was you. Why did you do that? To get a rise out of you. He grins at me. And for a second, I forget everything except the, faith, the fact that Nate McCauley still has an adorable smile. Also, I wanted to talk to you about all of this. He, but I guess it's too late. You must be all lawyered up by now, right? He smiled. The smile disappears. Yes, but I want to talk to you too. The bell rings and I pull out my phone. Then I remember Robin asking me to communicate records between the four of us and stuff it back into my bag. Nate catches the gesture and snorts out another humorless laugh. Yeah, exchanging numbers is a shit idea. Unless you want to use this. He reaches into his backpack and hands me a flip phone. I take it gingerly. What is it? An extra phone. I have a few. I run my thumb across the cover with a dawning idea of what it might be for, and he adds hastily, It's new. Nobody's going to call it or anything, but I have the number. I'll call you. You can answer it or not. Up to you. He pauses and adds, Just don't, you know, leave it lying around. They'll get a warrant for your phone and computer. That's all they can touch. They can go through your whole house. I'm pretty sure my expensive lawyer would tell me not to take legal advice from Nate McCauley and she's probably and she'd probably have something to say about the fact that he is an apparently inexhaustible supply of same cheap phones that corralled us all in detention last week. I watch him head up the stairs knowing I should drop the phone into the nearest trash can but I put it in my backpack instead.